Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, the School Building Committee's uh, Community Workshop number eight. Uh, tonight we're talking a little bit about schematic design and some days that we've started, so uh, thank you for coming. So in front of us tonight, we do have a, a 3D model of the design and uh, we're going to talk about transportation amongst some other uh, topics here on the list. As always, our committee is a cross-section of the entire community, uh, select and finance uh, citizens at large, uh, school members, other town members in our committee, uh, so we're trying to uh, always evaluate the best options for the entire town, and this is a town project. Uh, so it's great that we have this representation and that uh, we can help make a collective decision. So tonight we have uh, Joel Seely, our owner's project manager, and Kent Kovacs uh, from Landsberg Architects, who's uh, responsible for the design. So. I'm going to hand it off to Joel and uh, get started. Thanks, Jim. So first, before we, we start uh, the presentation, let's remind ourselves um, you know, why we're here. Um, we're here to develop a, 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 a mitigation plan, a, a design to uh, address the significant issues with the Peebles Elementary School. And it, this is a, a process that, that started many years ago, but in more in particular, uh, October um, 27, 2014, uh, the voters of uh, Bornstown meeting appropriated the funding for this feasibility study, recognizing the significant need uh, that, that uh, uh, Peebles was, was presenting and, and developing a, a solution in partnership with the MSBA to uh, secure a grant uh, for the overall development of the, of the project. And as it stands right now, uh, that grant uh, is estimated to be approximately $14 million. So it's a, it's a very significant uh, partnership with the MSBA and a very significant contribution from the state uh, to the town of Bourne. The MSBA is the, is the Massachusetts School Building Authority and they oversee all school construction across the state. Uh, they are a partner with all local communities, providing guidance, structure for, for the feasibility study as well as the design, uh, very uh, substantive regulations and, and guidelines to follow for each community. Uh, and if you follow those, uh, those guidelines and those regulations in partnership with the MSBA, uh, they'll provide a grant uh, uh, to each community. Uh, in our case, uh, that, that grant will be 43.84 percent of, of eligible costs uh, as we go through the project. Just recently, uh, July 20th, uh, the MSBA Board of Directors approved the, the preliminary schematic uh, report for this project. That is a very, very significant, significant uh, a, a vote of approval. Uh, that is saying to you, the town, that the MSBA Board of, of Directors agrees uh, with the design that's been submitted, uh, the option 5A, uh, and, and is um, uh, approving the town to go into the next level of design, that is the schematic design uh, phase, which you'll, we'll talk about tonight where we are with that. So it's a very, very significant, very, very important milestone for the town which, which gets us closer to realizing uh, that very, very significant grant uh, from the state. The MSBA process, as I said, is a very regulated process. Within the feasibility study itself, there's three main phases. The preliminary design report, or PDP phase, the PSR phase, or uh, preferred schematic report, and then the schematic design. In December, we finished the uh, PDP phase, uh, submitted it to the MSBA and, and staff. We had uh, multiple community meetings, multiple meetings with the, with the building committee here, uh, and that phase was completed, and it allowed us to proceed into the next phase, the preliminary schematic report phase, 
That was uh, submitted to MSB in June, uh, and then on July 2nd, July 20th rather, uh, the MSB Board of Directors voted and, and approved uh, the, uh, the, the option 5A. Very, very significant. So we are right now in the schematic design phase. We'll be submitting that back to the state um, on September 29th. That is the final submission uh, for the feasibility study. And at that point, the, the Board of Directors again will reconvene uh, and they'll analyze to make sure we stayed on track uh, with the option 5A and then they'll vote to approve uh, that overall appropriation and that overall grant. Can't see this, I know this is our guiding schedule. Uh, let's pull up a few dates. For that, we submitted the PDP in December 18th, uh, the PSR in July, June 2nd. Uh, we're we're gonna submit the schematic design on September 29th. Board approval uh, with that uh, schematic design will be November 9th of, of this year, November 9th, 2016. We'll be bringing the, um, we anticipate bringing the project uh, to the voters at the special town meeting uh, this October 17th, uh, 2016, uh, seeking appropriation for the overall project. Uh, and then on December 6th uh, of, of this year, 2016, we anticipate uh, being on, uh, with a successful town meeting vote, being on the uh, special ballot uh, election uh, vote for the debt exclusion vote. So all of the, um, the, the key dates in, in front of us are, have been established both uh, locally uh, as well as at the state level. Uh, the state has been a, an excellent partner, a very encouraging partner to the town because they really see that there's a significant, significant need, as Ken will talk about a little bit later, uh, with addressing the issues at the board, uh, at the People's Elementary School. The building committee, uh, which is made up of, of, of all um, town-wide um, representatives uh, in, in both selectmen, finance, school, uh, and members at large, been a great committee uh, in guiding this project for you. Um, and they have said all along we want to we have the most transparent, open process uh, that we can uh, for the development of the right solution for the people's school. And with that, we've had three community forums during that first initial phase, that PDP phase, in which we, we talked about all the various conditions, what are the potential options, what are the top three options. Then we had four uh, community forums during the PSR phase. Uh, again, uh, with the whole uh, goal of, of gaining as much community input in this overall process as possible. And it's been very, very enlightening, uh, very, very beneficial to the building committee as they've made um, this, this overall design process uh, come to this level with such significant community input. So far, we've had 21 school building committee meetings and we've been meeting just about every other week. They're open meetings. The majority of them are broadcast on, on Born TV, and we really encourage uh, participation uh, from the community at, at our meetings, and it's been and, you know, very beneficial. Uh, those 21 meetings uh, have uh, brought us to this point. We've had eight, seven community meetings. This is now the eighth one. Uh, we've had a town meeting report and three town board presentations. Um, we have additional town board presentations coming up. We've got a selectmen's uh, meeting presentation on August uh, 23rd, and we've got some future uh, meetings that are uh, being scheduled at, at, at this time. But again, the whole idea is a process of a very transparent and open process. We've had uh, two community-wide surveys uh, leading up to this point, which, which helped inform uh, the design. Uh, and we sort of televise all our school building and, and, uh, and, and community forums uh, today. Some of the completed milestones uh, really starting back to 2012. So it really does take a long time to get through this point. It's a, it's a very deliberate process that the MSBA has to make sure that the community is really investigating all of the options. And so starting in 2012, the board Town of Warren submitted the Statement of Interest. That was a document that uh, the selectmen, the school committee, um, and the, uh, uh, the superintendent 
uh, had to sign and submit to the state, and vote to sign and submit to the state, which identified and stated that there is a, a need to address it at the people's school. And so all, since the 2012, uh, there's been many, many steps along the way leading up to the design uh, that we will be presenting tonight. Just a few more of the key dates that, that we've gone through. Completed tasks, hazardous materials, investigation of the building, building evaluations, options development, traffic evaluations. Uh, we've developed multiple different options uh, for, uh, for review and, and uh, analysis, all leading up to the, um, the Board of, uh, of MSBA approving the option 5A. A uh, very, very significant uh, moment in, in, in the feasibility study. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ken. Thank you, Joel. Uh, looking at the need for the, the project, it uh, really stems to this. It's, it's provide a long-term solution for your existing area of Keyboard School. It's over 62 years old, uh, and it served the community well. Uh, provide educational spaces that meet the MSBA state standards. There's many spaces within Peoples that, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't support education for uh, Update the school and the division workshop goals provide 21st century educational spaces. I'll discuss some of these when we get to the design option. And it was well, a place that we to be proud of. This is a new building that we born and we made it the best uh, Looking at the people's school, just some of the uh, kind of the physical elements you see. This is a 1953 school. It's over 62 years old. There was uh, an addition built in 59 that has settled quite a bit in the back of the school. This building, um, the mechanical systems are uh, working. This is the, 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 the school committee facilities has done a great job to make building safe for the students, but it, it's at a cost, and it's going to continue to be at a cost. The mechanical system in the building, uh, the heat and temperature fluctuates very hard uh, to keep it constant within the learning environment. The windows, a lot of the people's facade is windows. It's glass, single pane glass that's really doing essentially keeping wind out, that's about it. it, it and there's no thermal uh, value at all to the brick or the windows. So we want to look at, um, just this is an antiquated building that, that it's, it's time to be uh, replaced. And some systems that need to be addressed in the near future, there's areas where the brick has been pulling away from the building, and this has been addressed in the past, but it needs to be monitored still. Uh, there's the settling in the addition. We know that this addition was built over the old leaching field and it settled about four inches. Uh, again, facilities has to come every year and undercut the door just to compensate for this building settling. Uh, there's limited areas covered by a sprinkler system and then there's some ventilation concerns in the cafeteria, the gymnasium, and the kitchen. Um, so again, these are some of the physical problems. Uh, but educationally, the library or media center is more of a circulation space. It's in the middle of the classroom, the classroom cluster. Uh, there, the art room is accessed off the cafeteria, the music room is accessed off the gymnasium. Uh, teachers, resource and plannings, have, they've done a great job kind of carving space out of closets, but again, it doesn't meet state standards. And that brings us to the project that uh, Joel uh, uh, was, was pointing out that the MSBA approved the option 5A, and this is a district-wide solution. And uh, this option, based on grades grants, creates a district-wide pre-K to two school that would be here at Warndale, a new school for intermediate um, elementary, three to five, at Peebles, that would be the new project. And then the middle school serves grades six to eight. Again, taking the fifth grade out of the middle school and putting it into an elementary school setting. Um, this is a dramatic shift in the current school configuration with benefits for all stakeholders from the modern public schools. So again, this isn't a singular building project. This is a project that's touching all the schools in the district and looking at it to maximize the benefits and, and give born the entire educational uh, school system uh, of what it needs to be in the future. So looking at this, this is how it breaks out. Again, Warrendale is pre-K to two in early elementary, Peebles is three to five, and then Warren Middle School. Some of the benefits here, the shared educational experience. All the kids are together experiencing the same as they move from one building to the next. Social emotional benefits, focus on developmental age. So each of the schools is focused, which is incredibly beneficial. More streamlined curriculum, 
uh, improved support for programs, student transitions. Uh, again, all the students of grade two move as a group to Peebles, and they move as a group uh, at grade five to the middle school. So they're always together, and that's very important. Uh, there's benefits to the middle school because now you're taking the fifth grade out of the middle school and you're creating appropriate spaces for grade six to eight. And then the Thorndale uh, school would serve uh, full day kindergarten. Um, this plan's a little fuzzy, but this is the Thorndale Elementary accommodating pre K through two. Uh, we have K and pre K on the first floor, and um, first and second on the second floor. Uh, what makes this school uh, lend itself to an early elementary is spaces that were cut back when this building was initially built. That gymnasium is half the size of what it should be serving an elementary school. But for an early elementary school, it's just right. Uh, it's around 3,000 square feet. There's a lack of sped spaces distributed through here, and so we want to look at improving uh, where we can in this in this building. I mean, going to an early elementary, uh, building a, a, a fits well that model. So looking at the middle school, this is just the second level. That's where all the classrooms are. So the second level of the middle school now would have a sixth grade cluster, seventh grade cluster, eighth grade cluster with science rooms. Each of these uh, uh, grades would have their own breakout space and team room associated with that. So we're looking at providing more sped spaces, more collaborative spaces within the middle school. And now just focusing on the design for this project. Uh, we didn't just arrive at this all district solution. There are many options studied. This is just a snapshot of some of the options. There was an option 1A that was a K-4, just the status quo, it's replacing peoples with the new building. There was that model of uh, addition renovation. We looked at an addition here, uh, serving grades uh, pre-K through four. Also a much larger building, an all district pre-K here at Thorndale, uh, an option 4A, uh, both new and at Reno serving uh, K through 4 on that side of the canal, but in all district fifth grade. And through all this is studies, uh, the option 5, which is where it's 3 to 5 emerged as being the, uh, the most viable and most practical model uh, to move forward. The MSBA recognized this for its benefits. So now looking at the design. This is a site plan that shows where the new people's building will sit in the area of the existing tennis courts on the high side of the site. Uh, in this general area is the existing people's school. But what's beneficial about this, it's a, it's a single phase construction project. The people's elementary remains occupied, school activities ongoing while this is being constructed. Uh, there's ample space to create a safe construction uh, zone away from the ongoing school activities. We relocated the tennis courts that were here uh, closer to the track and the field at this area and also provide parking associated with that. This area is the bulk of the school parking. There's a dedicated bus drop-off on the east side near the main entrance as well as a drop-off zone for parents. So you need approximately 700 feet in order to accommodate all the parents who are queuing during drop off. And that starts around here, this area, and goes all the way around to here. So we need to create a lane that can accommodate that many vehicles for drop off through the morning. Uh, the new building has a one way circulation route around the building, it's 24 feet wide. This allows parents to queue on the side and also allow emergency vehicles to pass them. So it's a very wide, one-way uh, access drive through the site. The way the building is designed, it is zoned into a clear community area where you enter here in the third grade wing on the first floor. And on the second floor, this is grades four and five. So there is proper zoning between community use spaces and the academic spaces. The uh, grades are clustered by Grades and we're able to create some great relationships uh, with the program and we go into that here. The main entry is right here where you can see this red arrow and this allows access for community use of gymnasium and the cafeteria. There's a stage that's positioned between the two so you can have a venue for 200 
students or an all-school assembly or larger community event within the gymnasium and share the resource of the stage. Administration guidance in the nurse's office is directly off of the main entrance for supervision. And that brings us into the heart of the school, the innovation area. There's an iStudio, which is the innovation studio. That's a program at the high school that the elementary students use. It's a project space, uh, and that's associated with arts. And inside the plan is an outdoor classroom that the art and the innovation studio can uh, extend the learning environment to the outdoors. We have a media center with spaces associated with the library, our media center, and then the third grade cluster here with the team room. On the upper level, we have grades four with the team space and grades five also with the team space. So that's the general layout of the plan. It's pretty uh, simple, very clear circulation from one area of the building to the next. Uh, in part of this study, we're finally starting to get into what does this building look like? And looking at the exterior, um, we don't want to come with a preconceived notion of what your building should look like. We want to take cues from Bourne, from the area. And we look at the bridge. We look at shingle-styled houses, clapper, and see a pattern that emerges. And this building, we want to have that cape feel. We see silver, grayish material that signifies permanence. And these buildings in here are, have been here for 50, 100 years, and they look weathered, but there's this great permanence to it. And that's what we want to capture within this building, a very light, clean building, clean edges. And so we're just getting into this, and I encourage everybody at the end of the presentation to come take a closer look at the model. Uh, this is just from our last school building committee meeting where we went through the model and looked at areas that may express the shingle style in some areas and a clobbered area uh, within the uh, protection of very important so we see clobber on this wing, and then also bring in the warmth of wood, natural material into the building. Let's look at it from the, uh, the other side, from the south side. Uh, with that, as an overview of the design, I'm going to turn it to Jim Playhock, Playhock, who's looked at our presentation plan and some of the options with that. Hi, good evening. Um, with, <clears throat> with the building of the new Peebles Elementary School and now both Warndale and Peebles becoming district-wide schools, uh, there's going to be a need to be changes in the, the school bus schedules and how the routes are structured. Um, so what we want to do, the purpose of you know, my involvement is to try to take a look at the bus routes, look at bell times, and come up with some different options for what the school bus routes could potentially look like. Um, typically in New England and throughout many parts of the country, uh, usually uh, school bus routes are either a two-tier or a three-tier structure. Uh, typical um, tier one would be the high school, tier two the middle school, tier three the elementary schools which you have here now. And then also, we see some two-tier rounding structures where the high school and middle school students ride together, and then the elementary schools are, are, are the same. Um, generally, um, a two-tier system is one where you're covering more geography, you have a bigger geographic footprint, uh, less dense population, whereas a three-tier system, it's a little bit smaller geographic footprint. This shows current uh, ridership, what will happen with ridership changes. You can see currently in the left-hand column, uh, these are the students that are assigned to school bus routes currently. And then with the reconfiguration of the schools and also at uh, one of the full-day kindergarten model where you're adding in, you're eliminating the midday kindergarten routes. So the, all the kindergarten students will be coming in in the morning and going home in the afternoon on the elementary routes. That adds uh, approximately 41 students. So uh, the numbers on each tier change a little bit. Uh, 
Uh, our current bus route structure, you have the high school on tier one, you have the middle school on tier two, and then you have the people's elementary and the Bordale on tier three. There's a total of 18 buses uh, that provide the, uh, that are currently 18 bus routes um, at the heaviest tier, which is tier two. Now here, here's, we have three options that we've kind of arrived at. One would be tier one, would be combining the middle school and high school together. Uh, this option would now require the middle school students to go in earlier than they do now. So they'd go from eight o'clock to seven twenty. The tier two would be the Peebles Elementary, the three through five, and they would be, they would basically move into the spot that the middle school used to be in. We, we, we changed it five minutes, but 805 to 225. And then the Borndale Elementary, three tier, going from 915 to 315. We needed to move that back a little bit. Right now, some of the buses are arriving a little bit late here. And uh, with pushing the people's back and just let the numbers change a little bit. We wanted to uh, add some extra time there. This option one would require two additional buses from the current structure. Option two is going to a two-tier system where tier one, we'd have the high school and middle school students together just as they were in option one, but we're going to move the bell times later, so we'd have the high school going in 7.40 in the morning, and now the middle school going in at 7.45. So now the high school goes in 25 minutes later, and I'm, I'm not an educational expert, but there's been a lot of studies that the high school students, um, a later bell time in the morning helps them in terms of they're, they're a little bit more awake and ready to learn. Um, I know Nasa Regional has, has made a change on their high school time and gone to a later time. So, you know, one of the benefits uh, may be that this, this is a improvement for the high school students on their, on their getting a little bit more sleep in the morning, maybe being a little bit more awake and being able to take in more information. Um, as I said, I'm not, not necessarily advocating for that, but there is, that is a general consensus. A lot of school districts are looking later bell times for the school students. And then uh, the tier two would be the Peebles and Borneo uh, on tier two at the current bell times at nine and three. So um, now this, this um, option requires 22 buses. So this is, this uh, option required two additional buses more than option one. And then option three is, the high school pretty much staying at the same time they are now, the middle school staying at the same time they are, and the Peebles and Bordale Elementary together uh, at that 915, 315. This uh, option three is also required to two buses. Uh, recommendations. Uh, right now there are there are a total of 22 buses in the fleet. 18 of them are everyday route buses. The other four are spare buses. If there's a mechanical breakdown, or they could be used for field trips or athletic trips. Of the 22 buses, five of them are 77 passenger vehicles. They're the flat nose or transit style buses. The other 17 are the conventional 71 passengers. I would recommend uh, in the next bus contract, going to more 77 passenger buses. The, the flat nose buses, um, even though there's greater capacity, their, their turning radius is, is similar to a 71 passenger. So if you can, if, if a current bus can maneuver down the streets without any issues, the, the flat nose 77 would also be able to do that. So, you know, it, just as an example, if you, if you went to 10 additional 77 passengers in the next contract, you pick up an additional 40 seats. Um, you know, you get one extra row basically in the 77 passengers. Over high school, and middle school, you pick up four additional seats 
per putts. Um, another thing we looked at is, is over time, bus routes can become stale and, and less efficient. Uh, you know, if we go forward with the project, you know, and, and I talked to Sue about it, it'd be, a good, it'd, it'd be a good time to kind of pause and take a look at the whole, all of the routes and see if there's any efficiencies that we can find. Um, that would be the perfect time to really try to take advantage of any of that we can. Um, we talked about a little bit before, in comparing the three options, uh, option one is really two additional buses, um, if uh, 55 to 110,000 from one to two. Um, for budgeting purposes, I think you, know, you want to say two. Yeah, potentially, because we're talking about doing routing three years from now. So, you know, the exact number of students, the exact addresses, all that detailed information we need to create bus routes we don't have today. So I think just for planning purposes and for budget purposes, we should look at two. Um, and then option two, um, we talked about needing uh, two additional buses beyond option one, so that'd be four additional buses. And option three is also the same there. Um, and, and looking at the, the children that are going to be affected, with the new district-wide schools. So the, if, if you have K through two students who live in Peebles and now are gonna have to be transported to Corndale, their time is gonna now be greater. They're being transported a farther distance. And then conversely, next slide. Oh, all right, yeah, we can look at the next slide. So, uh, first of all, the, the PK students are transported on vans at the district effort. So, the PK students are not on big buses. All right, so kindergarten uh, at Borndale, if you're a Cape Side resident, no change. <coughs> all the, is all the case? Because they go to Borndale. They all go to Borndale. Okay. So, um, so if you're a Cape Side resident from grade one or two, there's an additional 15 minutes. And then if you're an off Cape for three and four, there's an additional 15 minutes. So not all of the students are going to be affected, only the students that are going to be moving from one, one side to the other. And I think what, you know, what I talked was, you know, once again, we're talking about creating routes three years from now. But certainly what we'll try to accomplish in, in designing the routes is that the children, if there's a student that lives down in the family of mine and that is now being transported to Corndale, we want to do everything we can to, to make that route as short as possible so that it minimizes their additional time. And conversely, if there's students from the Corn Hill Center, they don't want to be able to so, um, You know, Sue and I have talked about that, and I'm sure, I'm sure you know, that's one of the considerations would be trying to minimize the, the additional time. Thanks, Jim. And as Jim said, um, you see, we're, we're starting the, these preliminary investigations and planning on the transportation plan. Um, and knowing that um, should the project be um, uh, voted uh, this fall, uh, and I'll go through the overall schedule, that we have, we have many years to, to really pinpoint and finalize the best uh, transportation plan. Um, we thought it would be prudent, though, at, th at this juncture, at this level, to kind of bracket those tiers, those different options that we have, that we'll certainly be grappling with over the next several years to get to make sure we get to the to the best plan uh, for the for the town of Warren. So, looking down the road, um, with a successful vote at uh, the special town meeting uh, this fall and the 
special ballot election um, uh, on December 6th. On December 7th, uh, the detailed design would commence. Uh, that is the detailed drawings to be able to um, right, provide to the contractor to secure bids and, and commence construction. Um, that uh, detailed design uh, phase would finish uh, approximately October 2017. It, it does take a while to develop the overall set of documents. There's various submissions to the state as well. They'll, they'll, they will continuously monitor this project uh, to make sure that we're designing to the project that they've board approved. Um, such that we would commence construction in November 2017 with the goal of opening up the new people's school August 2019. So that period of time that we just talked about to develop our transportation plan uh, to, be able to make sure that it is in place uh, for, for August 2019. So we have years to really make sure it's the best plan for, for the town. Um, after we open up the new school, uh, in, in August, uh, we'll then uh, demolish the existing people's school and, um, and, continue, and finish up the site work in around that area. So that's the long range uh, uh, overall schedule after the, the, uh, the town meeting and, and the special vote uh, this, this fall. Relative to project costs um, and project reimbursement from the state, uh, as I said earlier, the MSPA Board of Directors uh, voted to uh, approve uh, option 5A going into the, into the schematic design phase. Um, and that represents an approximate uh, $14 million grant from the state, uh, which is very, very significant. Uh, looking at the, the total project costs, uh, for uh, the option 5A, um, the, uh, it, it's comprised of building uh, costs of approximately 25 million, uh, hazardous materials and abatement of approximately 1.6 million, uh, site work of approximately 4.1 million dollars, with a total of about 30.9 million dollars for hard costs. That's that is the bricks and mortar. Along with that, uh, costs. Um, is uh, contingencies, uh, is furnishings and fittings and equipment, uh, uh, is uh, educational technology and systems, um, all leading up to a total project cost of, of $39.99 million. Um, that is the total project cost uh, for the option 5A as, as, as we see it now. The purpose of this schematic design phase that we'll be finishing in in September is to advance the design further so we can get additional cost estimates done. There'll be two independent cost estimates done. One uh, that is uh, retained uh, through my office, the Oakland Project Manager's office, and one that is retained through the architect's office. So you have two independent looks at what the building cost would be so that you're, you're really investigating the costs quite significantly. Those cost estimates then have to get submitted uh, to the MSBA, uh, who will review them as well. Um, all for the purposes of to making sure that the costs that we bring to you as the voters uh, are the costs uh, for the project. So how does the MSBA reimbursement work? Uh, the MSBA uh, has a rigorous process, as we talked about before, to make sure that uh, you know, we're investigating all aspects of the project. Um, They'll participate in reimbursing um, elements of the project that are eligible, their term eligible. So that means um, there are certain pro project costs that are ineligible. Uh, the MSBA treats those ineligible uh, metrics uh, for every single project across the state the same way. That is, they're charged with distributing as much as uh, the, the one cent on the sales tax that they get as a um, as a state agency uh, to develop and build school uh, projects to as broad a constituency across the community and across the Commonwealth as possible. And so they have some measures to help control how much, um, how much money um, communities uh, uh, get through each particular project. So they have some caps that are solely related to how much they reimburse um, on projects. 
recognizing that our some of the urban projects, some of the rural projects, some of the suburban projects, some of the large uh, football stadiums, some have no football stadiums. So these are metrics that they develop to kind of level the playing field. So site costs over 8% of, I'm reading from this quote now, site costs over 8% of, of the building costs are, are ineligible. The, the state just treats that, that same metric evenly across the Commonwealth. They don't say that, that uh, sites are supposed to cost 8% because they don't. Every single site, every single project is more than the 8% cap. The state recognizes that, but it's their way of evenly distributing the funding across as many projects as possible. Building costs over $312 a square foot. Asbestos flooring and abatement, uh, they don't reimburse for that. You do have some uh, over at Peebles. Uh, their expectation was that communities would have abated that over the years, uh, and in which is the majority of the projects that move forward, uh, you're not alone. Uh, asbestos flooring uh, was a significant material that was put in in the 50s and in the early 60s, and nearly every community that's doing the project deals, deals with asbestos flooring. Furnishing students and equipment or FF&E, that's all the teachers' chairs, the student chairs, the desks, etc. The technology costs over $2,400 a student. Uh, is, is ineligible, and then legal fees, moving ex expenses, and construction contingencies over 1% or 2% for renovations. Those are just their metrics. They use those evenly across the, the, the state. They don't mean that every project is, is to be within those metrics. It just means that's how they develop their reimbursement for them. So what does that mean to us? Uh, your base rate is 43.84%. Uh, of eligible costs, and then they have um, incentive points above that. Uh, it's zero to two points additional for maintenance. MSBA will tell us uh, what um, you will get for your maintenance reimbursement factor. It's all about how well you've maintained their, your buildings. They, they know all of your records because you have to submit them all. Um, we thought it prudent to, to carry 1% for the uh, the analysis that we're doing at this level. As we go through the schematic design phase, the state will give us what that exact reimbursement percentage will be. Uh, we believe it's gonna be over one, because um, uh, you've done a very well, very good job in maintaining your buildings, um, but we didn't want to be too uh, aggressive at this level. We should get that number over the next month, uh, month or so for the new SBA. Uh, and then green schools, uh, being having designed very energy efficient schools, uh, you're you're in a great position because your architect uh, is uh, is one of the best in, in the state at designing uh, highly energy efficient uh, green schools. And so, to be able to get those uh, two extra additional reimbursement points, we're very very comfortable that we'll be able to get those two extra additional reimbursement points, leaving a total of 46.84 percent of eligible costs. So how does that then translate against the $39.9 billion uh, total project cost? Uh, once you factor in all the formulas that MSBA has uh, for all the project costs, that equates to a, a grant of approximately $14.22 uh, million from the state for the project, which is a very, very significant, significant grant uh, for, uh, for a project of, of this size. Uh, and we feel very, uh, optimistic uh, with the MSBA strong support over the last month or so uh, leading up to the board vote that um, that $14.22 million will hold and it may even get a little bit better as we kind of refine the, the, the overall cost during this phase. Certainly the goal is to make sure that we're designing uh, as efficient, cost-effective, long-term building for the town of Warren. And so we'll constantly look at those costs to make sure you're getting the most value out, out of the project. And so what are the next steps? Um, tonight, we've got our, our community forum, uh, number eight. We've got a selectman's meeting on, on the, the, uh, the 23rd of, of August. Um, we've got community forum number nine. Uh, September 20th over at the Peeble School. We would encourage uh, the community to uh, participate in that meeting. Um, in September or 
October, we we're, we're working to schedule a, a meeting with the Finance Committee and, and other boards as we go through uh, this process leading up to the submission to the MSBA on September 29th, uh, anticipating uh, having uh, bringing the project to the voters at the October 17th special town meeting, uh, having the board of directors uh, provide the overall approval for the project. Uh, after that, at, on their November 9th meeting, which will then be able to bring it to the voters in their special uh, ballot election vote on, on December 6th. So all the dates uh, are, are firming up. Uh, uh, we, we anticipate these dates uh, at, at this moment and we'll continue to work with all of the boards uh, to make sure that uh, as, as we go through the process that uh, the dates are, are solidified and we will follow those milestones. Uh, all of the information that we've, we've developed over the last uh, uh, year uh, to a year and a half uh, uh, across all 21 building committee meetings, eight community forums, and, and the, the multiple surveys is all posted on the town's website. Um, the uh, uh, town office uh, was gracious enough to allow us to create a, a project website for all of uh, the citizens of, town, of the town to access, and so we've been posting, the building committee has been posting all relevant documents on that website. Uh, it's a very, very significant amount of information. Some of the reports are about a thousand pages, so we would um, uh, caution you not to you know, just, just you know, start to print some of them. Um, uh, and there, there are many, many, uh, many, many documents on, on the website. And we have an email account, uh, SBC at the town of Bourne, uh, and should you have any questions whatsoever, uh, the building committee uh, wants to answer them. Um, and so, um, with that, we'd like to open it up uh, to questions. <coughs> we uh, encourage uh, uh, participation as much as, as, as possible. I know it's very, very warm outside uh, today, so, uh, might be uh, you know uh, tough, tough coming out, but certainly at our at our building committee meetings, which are open to the public and they're all posted, um, please attend and, and also commit to attend our next community meeting. And um, and Jim, you want to any closing remarks? I'd like to thank everyone that did come out tonight. Uh, I guess we must be doing a good job because there's no questions. Uh, so we're meeting again next week. And uh, you can catch us uh, next week. <coughs> Please come to our meetings. Uh, we will have some further community presentations. Uh, all of our meetings are posted, but uh, we're meeting next week. Is is uh, next week seven o'clock? Is that? Yeah, the eighteenth. So uh, six thirty at the community building. Please attend and uh, participate in this process so that at the very end, uh, you know, we get the, uh, the best project for the town. So thanks again. Have a good night.
uh, always evaluate the best options for the entire town, and this is a town project, uh, so it's great that we have this representation and that uh, we can help make a collective decision. So tonight we have uh, Joel Seely, our owner's project manager, and Kent Kovacs so from Landsberg Architects, who's uh, responsible for the design. So I'm going to hand it off to Joel and uh, we'll get started. Thanks, Jim. So first, before we, we start uh, the presentation, let's remind ourselves um, you know, why we're here. Um, we're here to develop a, 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 a mitigation plan, a, a design to uh, address the significant issues with the Peebles Elementary School. And it, this is a, a process that, that started many years ago, but in more in particular, uh, October um, 27, 2014, uh, the voters of uh, Bourne's Town Meeting appropriated the funding for this feasibility study, recognizing the significant need uh, that, that uh, uh, Peebles was, was presenting and, and developing a, a solution in partnership with the MSBA to uh, secure a grant uh, for the overall development of the, of the project. And as it stands right now, uh, that grant uh, is estimated to be approximately $14 million. So it's a, it's a very significant uh, partnership with the MSBA and a very significant contribution from the state uh, to the town of Bourne. The MSBA is the, is the Massachusetts School Building Authority and they oversee all school construction across the state. Uh, they are a partner with all local communities, providing guidance, structure for, for the feasibility study as well as the design, uh, very uh, substantive regulations and, and guidelines to follow for each community. Uh, and if you follow those, uh, those guidelines and those regulations in partnership with the MSBA, uh, they'll provide a grant uh, uh, to each community. Uh, in our case, uh, that, that grant will be 43.84% of, of eligible costs uh, as we go through the project. Just recently, uh, July 20th, uh, the MSBA Board of Directors approved the, the preliminary schematic uh, report for this project. That is a very, very significant, significant uh, a, a vote of approval. Uh, that is saying to you, the town, that the MSBA Board of, of Directors agrees uh, with the design that's been submitted, uh, the option 5A, uh, and, and is um, uh, approving the town to go into the next level of design, that is the schematic design uh, phase, which you'll, we'll talk about tonight where we are with that. So it's a very, very significant, very, very important milestone for the town, which, which gets us closer to realizing uh, that very, very significant grant uh, from the state. The MSBA process, as I said, is a very regulated process. Within the feasibility study itself, there's three main phases. The preliminary design report, or PEP phase. The PSR phase, or uh, preferred schematic report. And then the schematic design. In December, we finished the uh, PDP phase, uh, submitted it to the MSBA and, and staff. We had uh, multiple community meetings, multiple meetings with the, with the building committee here. Uh, and that phase was completed and it allowed us to proceed into the next phase, the preliminary schematic report phase. That was uh, submitted to MSBA in June, uh, and then on July 2nd, July 20th rather, uh, the MSBA Board of Directors voted and, and approved uh, the, uh, the, the option 5A. Very, very significant. So we are right now in the schematic design phase. We'll be submitting that back to the state um, on September 29th. That is the final submission uh, for the feasibility study. And at that point, the, the board of directors again will reconvene uh, and they'll analyze to make sure we stayed on track uh, with the option 5A. And then they'll vote to approve uh, that overall appropriation and that overall grant. Can't see this, I know this is our guiding schedule. Uh, let's pull up a few dates. For that, we submitted the PDP on December 18th, uh, the PSR on July 6th, June 2nd. Uh, we're we're going to submit the schematic design on September 29th. 
board approval uh, with that uh, schematic design will be November 9th of, of this year, November 9th, 2016. We'll be bringing the, um, we anticipate bringing the project uh, to the voters at the special town meeting uh, this October 17th, uh, 2016, uh, seeking appropriation for the overall project. Uh, and then on December 6th uh, of, of this year, 2016, we anticipate uh, being on, uh, with a successful town meeting vote, being on the uh, special ballot uh, election uh, vote for the debt exclusion vote. So all of the, um, the, the key dates in, in front of us are, have been established both uh, locally uh, as well as at the state level. Uh, the state has been a, an excellent partner, a very encouraging partner to the town because they really see that there's a significant, significant need, as Kent will talk about a little bit later, um, with addressing the issues at the board, uh, at the People's Elementary School. The building committee, um, which is made up of, of, of all um, town-wide um, representatives uh, in, in both selectmen, finance, school, uh, and members at large, been a great committee uh, in guiding this project for you. Um, and they have said all along we want to we want to have the most transparent, open process uh, that we can uh, for the development of the right solution for the people's school. And with that, we've had three community forums during that first initial phase, that PDP phase, in which we, we talked about all the various conditions, what are the potential options, what are the top three options. Then we had four uh, community forums during the PSR phase. Uh, again, uh, with the whole um, goal of, of gaining as much community input in this overall process as possible. And it's been very, very enlightening, uh, very, very beneficial to the building committee as they've made um, this, this overall design process uh, come to this level with such significant community input. So far we've had 21 school building committee meetings and we've been meeting just about every other week. They're open meetings. The majority of them are broadcast on, on Born TV. And we really encourage uh, participation uh, from the community at, at our meetings. And it's been and, you know, very beneficial. Uh, those 21 meetings uh, have uh, brought us to this point. We've had eight, seven community meetings. This is now the eighth one. Uh, we've had a town meeting report and three town board presentations. Um, we have additional town board presentations coming up. We've got a selectmen's uh, meeting presentation on August uh, 23rd, and we've got some future uh, meetings that are uh, being scheduled at, at, at this time. But again, the whole idea is a process of a very transparent and open process. We've had uh, two community-wide surveys uh, leading up to this point, which, which helped inform uh, the design. Uh, and we sort of televise all our school building and, and, um, and, and community forums uh, today. Some of the completed milestones uh, really starting back to 2012. So it really does take a long time to get through this point. It's a, it's a very deliberate process that the MSBA has to make sure that the community is really investigating all of the options. And so starting in 2012, the board the town of Warren submitted the statement of interest. That was a document that uh, the selectmen, the school committee, um, and the, uh, uh, the superintendent uh, had to sign and submit to the state, and vote to sign and submit to the state, which identified and stated that there is a, a need to address it at the people's school. And so oh, since the 2012, uh, there's been many, many steps along the way leading up to the design uh, that we'll be presenting tonight few more of the key dates that, that we've gone through. Completed tasks, hazardous materials, investigation of the building, building evaluations, options development, traffic evaluations. Uh, we've developed multiple different options uh, for, uh, for review and, and uh, analysis, all leading up to the, um, the Board of, uh, of MSBA approving the option 5A. A very, very significant uh, moment in, in, in the feasibility study. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ken. Thank you, Joel. Uh, looking at the need for the, the project, it, uh, 
basically stems to this is, is provide a long-term solution for your existing area of Cambridge school. It's over 62 years old, um, and it's served the community well. Uh, provide educational spaces that meet the MSBA state standards. There's many spaces within Peoples that, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't support education for the board. Uh, update the school and the vision workshop goals. Provide 21st century educational spaces. I'll discuss some of these when we get to the design option. And it was all a place that Warren to be proud of. This is a new building in Warren, and we made it the best of it. Uh, looking at the people's school, just some of the uh, kind of the physical elements you see. This is a 1953 school. It's over 62 years old. There was uh, an addition built in 59 that has settled quite a bit in the back of the school. This building, um, the mechanical systems are uh, working. This is the, 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 the school committee facilities has done a great job to make building safe for the students, but it, it's at a cost, and it's gonna, it's gonna continue to be at a cost. The mechanical system in the building, uh, the heat and temperature fluctuates very hard uh, to keep it constant within the learning environment. The windows, a lot of the people's facade is windows. It's glass, single pane glass. That's really doing essentially keeping wind out, that's about it. it, it and there's no thermal uh, value at all to the brick or the windows. So we want to look at, um, just this is an antiquated building that, that is, it's time to be uh, replaced. And some systems that need to be addressed in the near future, there's areas where the brick has been pulling away from the building, and this has been addressed in the past, but it needs to be monitored still. Uh, there's the settling and the addition. We know that this addition was built over the old leaching field and it settled about four inches. Uh, again, facilities has to come every year and undercut the door just to compensate for this building settling. Uh, there's limited areas covered by a sprinkler system and then there's some ventilation concerns in the cafeteria, the gymnasium, and the kitchen. Um, so again, these are some of the physical problems. Uh, but educationally, the library or media center is more of a circulation space. It's in the middle of the classroom, the classroom cluster. Uh, there, the art room is accessed off the cafeteria, the music room is accessed off the gymnasium. Uh, teachers, resource and planning, have, they've done a great job kind of carving space out of closets, but again, it doesn't meet state standards. And that brings us to the project that uh, Joel uh, uh, was, was pointing out that the MSBA approved the option 5A, and this is a district-wide solution. And uh, this option, based on grace grants, creates a district-wide pre-K to two school that would be here at Warndale, a new school for intermediate um, elementary, three to five, at Peebles, that would be the new project. And then the middle school serves grade six to eight. Again, taking the fifth grade out of the middle school and putting it into an elementary school setting. This is a dramatic shift in the current school configuration with benefits for all stakeholders from the Warren Public Schools. So again, this isn't a singular building project. This is a project that's touching all the schools in the district and looking at it to maximize the benefits and, and give Warren the entire educational uh, school system uh, of what it needs to be in the future. So looking at this, this is how it breaks out. Again, Warrendale is pre-K through two in early elementary, Peebles is three to five.